While I was preparing this, uh, these lecture slides, I uh, recalled this quotation from uh, John Arbuthnot, 1692, who was one of the first people to actually use uh, epidemiology uh, and statistics in the study of uh, disease. Um, there are very few things which we know which are not capable of being reduced to a mathematical reasoning. And where a mathematical reasoning can be had, it's as great a folly to make use of any other as to grope for a thing in the dark when you have a candle standing by you. I just thought that seemed to encapsulate what uh, molecular genomics uh, offers at this point in time um, to, uh, to clinical medicine. It's, it's a complementary technology. It offers uh, alternative insight. And that's what I'm going to uh, be talking about today. Because as we enter the 21st century, mathematical reasoning, which is uh, specifically embodied in molecular biology, uh, has advanced to the point where we know the precise location of atoms in certain key molecules which control the human body. And we can use the genome to predict the location of atoms in many other molecules and predict with sufficient accuracy to understand the precise interactions between drugs and those molecules an understanding which is often proven elusive in the clinical environment. And that uh, is in fact exactly what we're talking about here. ARBs, statins, and you would all be aware of the uh, tremendous uh, amount of research that's been uh, expended on trying to figure out how ARBs differ from statins and differ from ACE inhibitors. The molecular genomics can help us understand what to look for when we go back into the clinical environment. So we're talking about atoms. Well, there are lots of atoms in the human body, <laughs> far too many for us to consider individually. This is a uh, picture from um, one of the figures from our recent paper, uh, common angiotensin receptor blockers uh, may directly modulate the immune system via VDR, PPAR and CCR2B. Those are all molecules uh, in the human body that have specific functions. And this particular picture uh, might look rather uh, pretty, but it's not very useful for its major purpose. Its major purpose is to show that this ARB here is docking or um, uh, has a strong affinity for the receptor. There is the rear of the ARB molecule and here is the front of the ARB molecule. But using a representation like that is not very helpful in terms of trying to understand um, how these molecules actually work. So in order to make it easier to understand the structure of very large proteins, a representation which highlights helices, folds and flaps has been developed. And we let the computer remember where each atom is located and focus on the overview. The previous slide showed just the upper right hand corner of this same GPCR up here but, the AR, but here, the ARB in the binding pocket can be far more clearly seen. This protein is the CCR2B receptor, which allows monocytes to migrate to regions of infectious and physical trauma. Uh, also, some HIV strains enter the phagocyte through CCR2B. So it's a fairly important molecule. We can also uh, produce two-dimension uh, two-dimensional molecular representations, which are extremely useful when we're trying to figure out whether we're looking at an agonist or an antagonist, whether the drug is acting in order to enhance the operation of the receptor or to block operation of the receptor. And uh, here is the same ARB and the same CCR2B binding pocket, but now you've got the detailed uh, atomic interactions. You've got each of the residues, each of the amino acids uh, in the receptor, and specific lines showing which of the um, ligand or which of the ARB uh, atoms are within um, a bonding distance or a, a certainly a, a van der Waals distance. And here is the hydrogen bond. The hydrogen bonds are very important because they uh, tend to be quite a lot stronger and uh, orient the molecules in the receptor. But in general, you only go to the 2D representation when you're going uh, for extreme detail. It's far too complex otherwise. Now we can also model pathogenic genomes. Here is a protein, 
proteins called SAR0276, uh, which is a putative membrane protein within the gen genome of methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus uh, uh, aureus, species MRSA2522, Staphylococcus um, protein, and docked into it, or uh, mated with it, uh, bound to it, is the molecule of the ARB omisartan. In an upcoming paper, uh, which we've submitted to the ISID, um, molecular genomics identify ARBs as a new class of antibacterial. It's all a matter of dose. We show how this ARB can be expected to inhibit the actions of the protein and thereby disrupt the uh, function of the MRSA252 organism. In this particular case, um, the way we uh, um, came across the uh, protein and realised that it was actually a GP GPCR family was using uh, standard uh, search, standard genomic search techniques uh, by homology with CCR2B, which was the molecule I showed you a little while ago, the one that's uh, prevalent on monocytes and causes the monocytes to migrate to areas of trauma. And this particular um, protein is in the uh, uh, MRSA genome and uh, its function, we don't know. But if it's ever expressed by the uh, organism, uh, the ARB, if the ARB is present in the uh, bloodstream of the individual, the ARB will go after that particular protein and bind into it quite firmly. Why do I have this here? Well, it turns out that this whole search that's led to the uh, presentation here today started off with uh, some papers back in the early 90s where biochemists that were working on the development of ARBs found that unless they uh, applied a bactericide uh, to kill any bacteria in their tissue samples that they, the, uh, the radio labelled uh, um, ARB was taken up by the bacterial um, uh, organisms and not by the tissue that was under test. And at the time I had no idea what was going on or why this would be the case and the biochemists didn't care about it, they just uh, just made sure they killed the bacteria in any tissue samples before they did their testing. But, but, it, but it, it was very interesting as to why bacteria would uh, have an affinity for uh, ARBs. And that's really what started me off on this search, and that's why it's here at this point in time. Now, what we've done is a very large computer search using uh, computer servers uh, running Linux, um, and some new software, um, well it's not that new, but uh, software which automatically docks ligands or drugs into proteins. Um, we've taken known proteins and we've taken some hypothetical proteins as well where we don't have an X-ray structure, so we can't be precisely sure that these are the correct shape, but we think they are. And then we've taken known proteins, VV, VDR and PPARG, which have actually been uh, photographed uh, uh, with uh, X-ray uh, spectroscopy in order to uh, find out, well actually not spectroscopy, but, but, but X-ray uh, techniques in order to find out exactly where the atoms are. And we've matched up the uh, common drugs with the receptors. And as you can see from this uh, table here, most of the ARBs and statins have some affinity uh, for uh, angiotensin II receptor, which is a GPCR, um, that's the receptor like we were looking at earlier, a membrane receptor. CCR2B, which is a putative uh, model again, um, and uh, VDR and PPARG, which are both nuclear receptors. Um, there are some that don't dock, and there are some that dock with quite high affinity. So this would not normally, uh, Losartan into VDR, for example, would not normally inhibit the uh, function of the VDR at the concentrations that uh, the drug is normally administered. But other drugs, such as telmosartan into VDR, uh, clearly significantly uh, affect the operation of both VDR and PPA, uh, PPARG at normal concentrations. This is uh, millimolar. The uh, graph is in millimoles. Uh, so what am I saying? <laughs> Sorry. It's nanomolar. <laughs> 
So um, with a 25 milligram daily dose tomasartan, for example, it, 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 will, affect, it, it will create uh, bloodstream concentrations uh, that will affect up to around 10 nanomolar uh, affinities. And certainly at the 0 0.04 and 0 0.3 nanomolar, um, there will be very great uh, interaction. Now, there are a number of surprising results from our study. The first thing is, we were amazed to find that there were no accurate molecular structures of the human membrane receptors, the human GPCRs, available. The entire class of drugs, the uh, ARBs, had been built on decades-old foundations, totally in vitro work. Um, then, when we managed to construct a viable putative model, because we had to go back to fundamentals and say, well, can we construct a model for the angiotensin II receptor that makes sense, that has the conserved regions in the right spot, that binds the molecules that we know that binds the drugs that we know bind into it, binds them with the correct affinities. That's what we call a putative model. Um, not verified with uh, X-ray, but gives us something to work from. At that point, we found that the uh, NDA, the uh, new drug application in vitro work, had been done with bovine and guinea pig tissue, and that there were two key binding pocket residues isoleucine-193 and leucine-205, which differed between the animal genomes and the human genome, thus equivocating, making uncertain quantitative essays. And I've highlighted the two residues that are mutated here. This residue is mutated in Bostorus, and this uh, residue is mutated in Cavia Porcellus. Um, and you can see I've got a candesartan, an ARB bound into the binding pocket, and there is actually an oxygen on the candesartan that is very tightly bound to the uh, interleucine 193 of Bastorus. One of the things that we found in our study was that we couldn't match up uh, accurately enough, or as accurately as we expected. We couldn't match up the expectations for the uh, binding affinity of candesartan that were listed in the NDA with the uh, binding affinity that we were simulating in our receptor. And then when we had a look and realised that the NDA had been done with Bostorus, um, or a, a protein um, from uh, the animal genome, we suddenly realised that there is a, a huge difference in affinity at this point. Um, and uh, that tended to uh, make us feel a little bit more comfortable with our model for the angiotensin receptor. Here is the entire picture of the uh, GPCR and you can see the uh, binding pocket is up here uh, behind uh, helix 6 and between helix uh, helices 5, 4 and 6. The uh, candesartan is bound up there. Um, um, I might add that this is a membrane protein so most of this region, the central region of the protein is uh, within the uh, um, membrane the, the region at the bottom here is uh, in the uh, cytoplasm and the region uh, at the top is extracellular. I might need that, uh, that laser pointer. Mine seems to be getting weaker as, <laughs> as the uh, time goes by. This is one. Is it ready to go? Oh, yes, there we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there we go. So... So this is the uh, transmembrane region, this is the uh, extracellular region, and this is the intracellular uh, uh, and signalling region. But you know, the biggest surprise we had was that, that the extremely high affinity which the ARBs had for VDR and PPAR gamma, which are nuclear receptors. These are in the nucleus, not on the membrane of the uh, phagocytes, but in the nucleus of the phagocytes. And they're key to the operation of the immune system. So while it was reasonable that these highly flexible um, polar ligands, uh, the ARBs and statins, ligand is a term for drug, um, technical term for drug, but wh while uh, it was reasonable that these highly polar, very flexible ligands might well have a good affinity for other GPCRs, membrane proteins, other than angiotensin II type 1 receptor, we never expected them to have uh, such a high affinity for the nuclear receptors. 
VDR and PPAR gamma are located in the nucleus of cells and are some of the molecules which cooperate using a complex interplay of dimerization. Dimerization is where proteins bind to each other to form uh, multiple uh, complexes called dimers. Um, with activation by a variety of ligands, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a later slide, which transcribe genes from the host DNA into messenger RNA. In turn, in turn this RNA will be translated by the ribosomes into proteins, into protein strands, which are long protein strands, and they are then folded into the final shape, for example, that GPA, GPCR shape, with lots of enzyme, uh, with lots of uh, folds. They're folded by, uh, obviously, electrostatic forces, but also enzymes, and there's some feeling <coughs> that other nuclear receptors are involved in, in protein folding as well. But uh, th these are at the very heart of the genome. Uh, all of the uh, proteins produced by the cells come from this DNA uh, transcription process. VDR is the first one um, we uh, look at and the correct operation of the VDR is key to both the endocrine and the immune systems. Some functions of the VDR include decreased uh, parathyroid hormone transcription. It lowers uh, high levels of uh, um, VDR generally uh, correlate with lo low levels of PTH uh, because it decreases the transcription of PTH. Uh, it regulates the toll-like receptor 2 and toll-like receptor 4 expression and these are receptors which are on phagocytes and they're part of the innate immune response. In fact, they're key to the innate immune response. VDR regulates them and uh, consequently regulates the response of the body to bacteria. It transcribes CAMP, Catholicidin antimicrobial peptide, and that is a, an endogenous uh, antibiotic that the body makes which attacks a lipopolysaccharide uh, on gram-negative bacteria. Um, there are a number of endogenous antibiotics, that's one of them, and we know for certain that that is transcribed by the VDR. It regulates the TACO gene, and uh, the TACO gene is... Uh, associated with mycobacterium tuberculosis survival intraphagocytic. In other words, how the uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, when it's invaded a cell, how it manages to survive uh, phagocytosis. Regulates the TACO gene. It binds the interleukin-2 promoter and therefore transcribes interleukin-2, another key uh, immune cytokine. It also promotes transcription of insulin receptors uh, turns the DNA, transcribes the DNA into RNA so that insulin receptors can be made. It interacts with uh, cofactors SRC1 and SRC3. Those are uh, steroid receptor cofactor, SRC steroid receptor cofactors, which are inhibited by uh, P65, which is half of uh, nuclear factor kappa B. Again, immune system. And we know it's associated also with uh, the granulocyte micro macrophage stimulating factor, another key immune si system function. It regulates TGF beta signaling and uh, DRIP coactivators. DRIP is D-receptor -re interactive protein, so <laughs> it's a creative name, I think, but, but DRIP coactivators, all of which regulate cell differentiation and apoptosis. And there's a URL there of a search engine which will uh, specifically search for... Um, citations on, uh, on the VDR, if any of you are, are interested in looking further. Um, there is so much activity in um, molecular genomics at the moment looking at the VDR. We published a paper not too long ago, mid-January, and recently I wanted to look it up on PubMed. So uh, I'm lazy, and rather than type in the full name of the author and the normal ways I would retrieve my own paper, I just typed in VDR, carriage return. I thought, well, it'll be somewhere on the first page. No way. There have been 40 papers on VDR published since ours in uh, mid-January, at the rate of about one a day. And half of those are on the immune system and the importance of this receptor to the immune system. PPAR 
um, is another receptor. Uh, there are two forms, um, peroxisome prol proliferator activation uh, receptor is the uh, full uh, acronym, but PPAR affects the generation of liquids and it also, uh, of lipids, lipids, and it also transcribes uh, key immune system genes. And here's a quote which I, I thought was rather good from one of the papers that I reviewed. Uh, PPAR gamma was originally discovered as a pivotal, a pivotal regulator of adipocyte differentiation, but it's intimately involved in the regulation of expression of a myriad of genes that regulate energy metabolism, cell differentiation, apoptosis and inflammation. Due to the links with fat cell development, insulin and glucose metabolism, drugs which affect PPAR gamma are likely to profoundly modulate the lipid metabolism. PPAR gamma also modulates the immune system, especially vascular inflammation. And then the other uh, receptor that we looked at initially was PPAR, PPAR alpha which is involved in um, mediating cholesterol, uh, cholesterol ester hydrolase, CEH, which is part of the macrophage cholesterol homeostasis. It also stimulates keratinocyte differentiation and it attenu attenuates development of hypertension and of oxidative stress uh, and additionally attenuates vascular complications and it's linked with insulin and the corticosteroid metabolism. Again, a key receptor for the immune system. The, the last few slides uh, have described many of the effects of ARBs and statins, which are currently creating surprise in, in clinical trials. That uh, ARBs and statins affect, uh, for example, uh, diabetes, uh, certainly the complications of diabetes, and also atherosclerosis. So what we did was we decided to take the key nuclear receptors which have got known structures for them. It was ones where we could be quite certain that we knew we were dealing with a real molecule and not with one that we had derived and tested. And they turned out to be the VDR, the PPAR alpha, the PPAR gamma, the GCR glucocorticoid receptor, the MCR mineral corticoid receptor, progesterone receptor, androgen receptor, and thyroid alpha-1 and thyroid beta-1. There are four thyroid uh, receptors, um, and uh, we just selected those two because they were available as X-ray models. Now, what do these nuclear receptors do? Well, they, they join together in heterodimers, or they couple with each, with, within the same receptor as homodimers, they couple with coactivators, they are very inter interdependent, and they are very redundant. Um, if you take out one receptor, for example, if you knock out the uh, beta-1 thyroid receptor from, uh, from mice, then the mice end up deaf, but everything else seems to work correctly. Uh, so th there is a lot of uh, redundancy. If you knock out, however, the GCR, the glucocorticoid receptor, the mice don't get beyond gestation. It's one of the reasons we don't know very much about what the GCR does because the mice never actually are born alive for us to, to do further testing on. But what these nuclear receptors are responsible for is transcription of DNA genes to strands of mRNA which are then translated in the ribosomes into proteins. Now, if you want some basic uh, uh, genomics uh, uh, tutorials. There is a simplified set of flash animations at that particular URL which I've found to be particularly simple uh, to understand and yet quite accurate. So we're now going to look at some simplified 3D animations of these transcription molecules. Just enough to give a, an overview of what the, what the nuclear receptors do and how the corticosteroids, ARBs and statins affect gene transcription corticosteroids now because as, as we went further and further into this study we widened out the scope of uh, interest as to what we were looking for. What I have there is a close-up of the skeleton of a GCR homodimer. What that means is there are two GCR uh, zinc finger regions here, two proteins, uh, and they are coupled together actually through this uh, 
zinc finger complex. And they're sitting on top of uh, DNA. You can see the double-stranded DNA here. Um, and these helices, uh, actually underneath the zinc fingers, it's hard to see, but that, that, that helix and this helix are responsible for uh, causing the DNA to uh, the bonds in the center of the DNA, which are all hydrogen bonds. There are not any molecules here in the center of the DNA strands. Cause those hydrogen bonds to uh, uh, break apart by forces from the molecules here, and that causes the particular genes to be transcribed. Very simplified explanation, but it'll do. Incidentally, if any of you have questions as we go along, um, feel free to ask them. Wrong one. Uh, try the right one. Ha, ah, there we go. Now this is that same complex, but with a different, a different perspective. You can see the, the DNA at the bottom. In this case, every single atom in the complex has been labelled. We can select a different type of display here. We'll just select the, uh, the normal ribbon configuration. And you can see your DNA strands. And on here is the receptor that we saw on the bound into there that we can see on the previous slide. And I just wanted to show you the um, backbone of the DNA. And you can see particularly the gaps here across the center of the nucleic acids, those are hydrogen bonds that fill those gaps. And those are what are broken uh, by the uh, nuclear receptors as they cause the, the uh, protein transcription. Actually, the gene transcription into RNA. I don't know whether that's uh, clear. That was the uh, clearest uh, way I could think of showing what these things do. It's not. Uh, that simple a concept. They're absolutely key to the operation of the cell. Well, here's a, a graph that uh, I'm sure most of you will be a bit more familiar with. What we have here is a percent saturation on the left-hand axis, 0 to 100 percent, and drug concentration across the bottom. And uh, we have the uh, normal curves, which uh, indicate uh, the IC50, which is equal to the bound a natural ligand plus KD, where KD is a dissociation constant, or minus uh, log 10 of KI. KI values were what were on the other slides. And what I'm looking at is the homologous binding to VDR. In other words, we're not assuming any saturation of either the drug or the uh, re receptor, therefore it's homologous binding to the VDR, with simvastatin versus 125D, which is in orange, and telmosartan versus 125D, which is in yellow. And I put a note there that the prednisolone KD is very similar to simvastatin, and it will have a similar uh, attenuation of, uh, or a similar displacement of uh, the active 125D from the, um, uh, from the VDR. Um, the reason the yellow band is so wide is because the uh, concentration at the lower end of the yellow band is the concentration of 125D in blood, and the concentration at the upper end is the uh, predicted concentration inside the cells. It's quite a bit higher inside the cells, of course, somewhere in the region of 1 nanomolar, 1 to 2 nanomolar. Um, that's been determined in vitro, approximately. The KD values were derived from modelling. And you can see that as the drug concentration increases, the displacement of the uh, original uh, ligand, the active, uh, the active uh, 125D in this case, uh, drops to zero, which is as you expect. The more drug you take, the more it's going to uh, displace the active ligand and disable, because these are all antagonists, disable the receptor. And that by the time you get to 10 nanomolar concentrations, which are typically what is used, uh, 1 to 10 nanomolar are typically what's used when these drugs are dosed uh, in a pharmacologic uh, application, um, they have significantly impaired the functioning of the VDR. So here's a table. I was told that uh, FDA loves tables. <laughs> so here's a table, and on the left we've got the um, 
various drugs. We've got the ARBs and then the statins. And over the top, we've got VDR, PPAR gamma, PPAR alpha, the glucocorticoid receptor, mineral corticoid receptor, the uh, pr progesterone receptor, and alpha thyroid and beta thyroid. I've left off the estrogen receptors and the androgen receptors because honestly they don't change uh, the, the overall picture very much. And what you can see looking at this table is there are an awful lot of numbers which are below one. And any of these numbers that are below one indicates that that drug is going to have a very significant impact on that receptor at normal concentrations that these drugs are administered uh, in, pharmaco in pharmacology. Um, some of them, like for instance telmosartan, doesn't really affect the thyroid receptors, the MCR or a progesterone receptor very much, but it really knocks uh, out P VDR, PPA gamma and PPR alpha. Um, and same with atorvastatin, it uh, uh, is quite strongly, um, has a strong affinity for PPR gamma and alpha, um, but not too much on the thyroid. Um, but the other thing that's really clear from this is that every ARB and every statin is a little bit different in its activity profile. So whereas clinical medicine looks at a statin as being a statin and really doesn't pay very much uh, attention to whether it's simvastatin or atorvastatin, uh, Lipitor or um, Socor, um, there actually is a huge difference in their profile in terms of what receptors they're uh, affecting in the in the human body. And um, the, uh, but one thing that's common to them all is that all of the statins affect PPAR alpha and PPAR gamma. Some of the statins also affect VDR, known, notably simvastatin and lovastatin marginally. Um, but that's not unreasonable if you think about it. You've got a drug that's targeted at uh, lipids and it goes after the PPAR receptors. That could be the primary mode of action. We don't know. But certainly the job of molecular genomics is to point it out so that then uh, the in vitro work and the clinical work can go away and say, oh yes, that's true, this is a, a major function of this class of drugs. And a major reason for the way that they act in which they do. And the same with the ARB. Some of them have a high affinity for the uh, VDR and PPARs. Candesartan, you see, does not have high affinity for VDRs and PPARs. But have a look over here at the thyroid. The thyroid receptors, Candesartan uh, uh, has a very high affinity to. Um, and uh, at the other end of the string, you've got something like Valsartan, which does actually not the thyroid. Can I well. ask you an yes. FDA sort of question? Yes. Um, to what extent do, do you <coughs> I see the numbers are all over the place. To what extent do we know, let's say, on thyroid function? How much is thyroid function affected when these numbers are low and we know that there's replacement? Um, with numbers around 0.5 and 0.7, um, that receptor is going to be uh, almost totally blocked by the, the ligand. So now what the effect of that is on the body right. is a much bigger imponderable question because well, as that's I said... What, that's what we're interested in. Yeah. <laughs> can you make that... that uh, well, I, I mean, you, you, can, you can look at it from two points of view. The first point of view is that really these drugs shouldn't be doing anything in the nucleus. They shouldn't be affecting the thyroid, for example. So, um, so that's the first observation you can make. And then the other observation you can make is, well, the people are sick, <laughs> they need a drug. So where is the middle ground? Um, how can we select a drug that... Well, no, if we know the thyroid is being affected, there are medical steps that can be taken. But it, it, so that a person who knows that yeah. giving this drug will have this effect, yes. we can take amelioration steps. Yeah, absolutely. But you, if, could, you can but, supplement but, uh, thyroid seed, for example. We have to be sure that we're not supplementing a person who doesn't need the supplement. Well, I, I think my, my major message, the, the, the major thing that's in my mind, is that we need to be measuring and looking. So when somebody is being given candesartan, for example, we should be measuring the uh, uh, T3, T4 and TSH. Uh, and if it needs supplementation with, with T4, uh, with thyroxine, then 
that might be a good trade-off. I mean, that has to be judged by the clinicians as to what trade-offs are there. Uh, was this assay done in membranes or cell port cell? This, this is mathematic. This was done uh, in a computer. Uh, no. No in vitro work at all. Okay, so what, what, what this needs to be done, uh, what needs to happen now is these numbers, which are very hard to determine in vitro and determine in a clinical environment, these numbers have to be kept in the back of our minds as we go back to the in vitro work and the clinical work and figure out what to measure, what to look for, in order to elucidate the, the function of the uh, uh, What clearly drug. stands out is that some of these compounds here are uh, uh, water-soluble, they don't have uh, binding into the extracellular membrane, neither are they transported into the cell. Uh, one of these examples which stands out in the studies, you can see that unless it's in the liver hepatocytes, it doesn't go into the cell at all. Uh, but I could see numbers very impressive in nanomolar range. Uh, it just makes it hard to understand. Well, I, I can tell you for certain that Olmesartan directly uh, uh, affects the, the VDR because I have seen clinical data which indicates that uh, the levels of 125D uh, and PTH and secondarily the thyroid hormones react to administration of Olmesartan. And yet in the NDA, Olmesartan is listed as not having any permeability through erythrocyte membranes. So frankly, I think that's wrong. So I think that what we need to do now is go back and figure out, well, how much is getting in, if any is getting in. I mean, let me put it another way. You're telling me that Olmosartan can't get into the phagocyte, and yet HIV can? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. It, it just doesn't stand the... the the, 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 the taste test, it just doesn't sound right. And, and as I said, with Olmosartan, we know because we've got some uh, anecdotal clinical data. Uh, that's why we looked at VDR, because it was reported that when people started to take Olmosartan, that their 125D levels plummeted. In one patient, it dropped in half within two weeks. So that's why we looked at VDR. I mean, you, you can look at other drug disease receptors and they don't bind. Uh, but the ones that I'm showing you on, on these slides generally have an affinity, and that's why they're on the slides. The 99.9% .9 of the computer runs that we did, which didn't come out with an affinity, are not on the slides. Does that uh, answer your question? Um, but yes, that's a very good question. But on the next slide, there really is a lot less, um, uh, a lot less doubt. These are... Uh, all uh, uh, nuclear, th these are all uh, drugs which are active in the nucleus. The steroids are active in the nucleus. And so we know they're there. And we know all of these are active in the nucleus. And we can see some very interesting things that are coming out in the, um, uh, in the, ma that the mathematics is telling us, in the genomics. We can see that, for example, 125D3, which is the active ligand for VDR, has actually 10 times higher affinity for the beta thyroid, and similar for the alpha thyroid. And that lines up with anecdotal um, uh, indications we have that, in fact, high levels of 125D in sick people does affect their thyroid function. Um, we can also see that uh, cortisol, for example, has a different uh, profile from prednisolone. For example, into PPAR gamma, there is a significant difference in affinity, whereas into the VDR, they're about the same. Same with PPAR alpha, there's a significant difference, um, and there's not much into the alpha thyroid, two to one. Uh, the, the amount of error that's involved in the molecular genomics calculations is quite high, and, and you get anywhere within three to one or so, and the numbers are essentially you have to regard the numbers as being essentially the same. Um, dexamethasone also has a different profile from prednisolone, which is interesting, and that could be clinically useful if, if it's kept in mind as, uh, as uh, clinical trials are performed. 
but you can see that dexamethasone uh, to uh, cortisol is, is somewhat more accurate uh, except in the thyroid receptors, it's somewhat more following the profile than prednisolone is. And then um, for completeness, I've shown the secosteroid uh, vitamin D3 at the top, which is also active in all these receptors. Um, and as you can see, that also hits the thyroids pretty hard. Well, this was the question you were asking. What does this mean to the FDA? Well, just as John Arbuthnot said, if you've got some information, use it. And use it to try and understand the bigger picture. Because um, there has been so much effort put into uh, trials, clinical trials of ARBs versus ACE inhibitors. And if the molecular genomics had been applied at an earlier stage to give insight into what to measure in these trials, what sort of endpoints could we expect, then uh, a lot of uh, inefficiency and also the answers would be coming up a lot more quickly as well. By predicting the biological molecules which a particular drug is going to target, obviously the clinical researchers can be guided as to what side effects to look for if they're unwanted um, or as to what metabolites to measure in order to uh, get the best overview of dosage and efficacy profiles. For example, uh, I said there's one publication a day on the VDR and yet I would doubt that there are very many uh, applications before the FDA at the moment that even measure the metabolites that are affected by the VDR, and yet it's the key immune system um, receptor. It does key functions, and certainly is key to any uh, infection um, uh, capability that the, uh, that the phagocyte has, anti-infective capability. We need to watch these things. If a drug hits VDR, PPA gamma, and PPA alpha, the clinical uh, trials need to be told, be aware of infection, log infection. Um, additionally, in vitro testing is not very selective. You can add a drug to a cell line that might affect dozens of different metabolic pathways at once. And the art of uh, the, the expert of the, of the, uh, uh, of, of the um, perfectionist in in vitro, of course, is to stop this and to try and focus in on the the, uh, the, the one metabolite that you're interested in. But it doesn't always work. In our paper, we looked at a study which had shown that telmosartan was a partial agonist of PPAR. And we pointed out that we felt that it was far more likely that uh, telmosartan was affecting VDR. And since VDR wasn't being monitored in this particular in vitro experiment, that was why they were seeing the specific results that they got. Modeling is very precise and will isolate likely effects to the level of the individual molecule. But the two techniques are complementary, each reducing the need to grope about in the dark, as, as Arbuthnot says. They have to be viewed as complementary. And I think the example you gave of do these drugs even get into the nucleus is key to that. I mean, the, it has to be viewed from both points of view. And if you assume that the drug doesn't get into the uh, cell, uh, either through the outer membrane or the, or the nuclear membrane, um, then the clinical uh, uh, trials will be looking for a different set of metabolites. But if you think there's a possibility it might get in, you can measure the effects that it would have. And if you see those effects, you know that uh, it is in fact getting in there and modulating the uh, metabolism. Now let's look at two example case studies. These were just a couple of drugs that came up uh, while I was uh, preparing this presentation about a week and a half ago. I was watching an advertisement on TV which showed some persuasive animations purporting to demonstrate how the drug uh, azetamide, Zetia, reduces the absorption of fat from the GI tract. You've probably all seen these television advertisements. And since I know that the, the lipid and cholesterol metabolism, much of it traces back to the VDR and, and PPAR, it occurred to me to look at the NDA. And when I looked up the NDA on azitamide, 
I found a known mechanism of action. So we ran a, a scan on, on azitamide. And the next day, Reuters carried a news article about a study with Remonabant, which uh, the study, if I recall, uh, had um, caused an average of 15 pounds of weight loss in, in a year in a uh, particular cohort. And I also took a quick look at that drug as well. Now, Remonabrand is actually fascinating because if you were designing a drug to target VDR and PPARs, this would be the drug. You can see that it has no effect on the other nuclear receptors. The 72 is uh, uh, negligible at the dosages used. Uh, and it has a very significant effect on PPAR alpha in one of the isomers, and the other isomer has a very significant effect on PPAR gamma. And a uh, moderate effect, uh, this uh, isomer uh, effect on VDR is moderate, probably wouldn't uh, show up at the 25 milligrams used in, in the trials. Similarly for azetamide, uh, just like the statins, it affects the PPARs and affects them fairly strongly. Seven, is, seven nanomolar is a fairly strong affinity at a typical uh, dosage for azetamide, which is also in the 25 milligrams a day uh, region. Isomers. Those of you that know what an isomer is, uh, please uh, bear with this. I just wanted to go over a quick slide to show what isomers are. Um, isomers are when you have two configurations of a molecule. And this is the molecule uh, for a Remonabrand. And if I rotate the thing around... Okay, so I've now rotated this backbone here so that the oxygen is facing towards us, the backbone is, is, is rotated around. And you can see in one case, this benzene ring is with the two uh, chlorines is on the bottom, and in this case, the benzene ring with the two chlorines is on the top. And if I rotate it, you can see that where it is all depends on the angle with which it's bound to this nitrogen. There is a hydrogen on the nitrogen as well, which is not shown. Um, you normally drop hydrogens out of molecules at the molecular genomics level because you get lazy. The computer knows where the hydrogens are. But there is a hydrogen on this uh, nitrogen and if, if it changes in location, then you get an isomer. It's the same drug, but it's a different shape. There are many enzymes in the human body that can change uh, drugs from one isomer to the other. Uh, the classic case, of course, is thalidomide, and I'm sure you've all been through thalidomide, where one of the isomers, the one that we didn't think existed in the human body, turned out to be pterogenic. Now, Remonabrant does, in fact, go into the ca cannabinoid receptor. It's a cannabino can cannabinoid antagonist, and um, I've shown that uh, alongside... Um, the um, agonist, which is called WIN55212-2, which is a cannabinoid receptor type 1 uh, agonist. You can see that they're not lying in the same general location. They act on different residues, and uh, Remonabrant is an uh, antagonist, exactly as is stated in the, um, in the press release from Reuters. Um, uh, except that the, the interesting thing is that it has about the same affinity for this receptor as it has for the PPARs. Come on. So I wanted to um, finish here by making a suggestion as to where we can go from here. Um, the last slide, which I'll go back to, the last slide this uh, cannabinoid receptor was uh, supplied to me by Tiziano Tucinardi, uh, who's a PhD student at Pharmaceutical Sciences in, in Pisa, uh, Pisa uh, Italy. And uh, he'd published a paper, the PubMed ID uh, link is there, uh, on the cannabinoid receptor, and um, they had produced a putative model and tested it fairly extensively. So I wrote to him and said, can you send me one of these receptors because I want, I've got this uh, uh, drug that I want to try in the cannabinoid receptor to see what it does. So he sent it to me, I tried it, it docked in there exactly as advertised. But it shouldn't have to do this. It shouldn't have to track down uh, these receptors. These receptors are key to the operation of the body. They're key to the operation of drugs. 
And why can't we have a database with at least the receptors, which are part of the human body, there's no copyright on them, there's no patent rights on them, well, <laughs> mostly there's no patent rights on them. <laughs> um, why can't we have a library of these receptors, just like the RCSB uh, structured data bank, so that uh, uh, people like the student in, in Italy that I got that cannabinoid receptor from uh, can deposit the receptor and other students elsewhere in the world can take these and do what, what we have done uh, with our studies, show that, in fact, um, there is a, a significant spectrum of activity beyond what um, current uh, uh, medical knowledge um, uh, portends. Uh, there's a significant body of information that we could be using the actions of drugs in the human body. Um, the, RCBS, the RCSB uh, data bank is supported by Science Foundation and a whole stack of uh, NIH and uh, other bodies, including DOE. And I was going to suggest that maybe some of these organisations might join the FDA to help gather together a data bank which would allow students and scientists to more easily study the actions of the pharmaceutical drugs. So much research energy has been expended on the ACE inhibitor versus ARB controversy and better research data would have hastened resolution. Such a database would also allow rapid analysis of reported side effects and unexpected drug interactions so that when a side effect is reported that appears way off the wall, it, th we can go back to the molecular genomics and say, well, is it that unreasonable after all? In fact, I think uh, today um, there is a uh, discussion of an MS drug which uh, uh, has uh, uh, an unwanted side effect of uh, uh, infection or allowing infection. And uh, if, if those drugs were screened against a known uh, set of receptors and uh, enzymes which are known to be uh, involved in the immune system, it would give us a, a very good starting point to work from uh, for the clinical trials. So I see that it's four o'clock and uh, I'll be staying after the presentation to chat and I'd, I'd love to uh, speak with uh, any of you that uh, are interested in this topic and I'm also going to be here tomorrow morning Wednesday the 8th um, and I'd love to talk with groups or individuals at that time um, that might be interested in looking at these uh, issues in more depth or, or maybe just uh, looking at the issues in the in the same depth but looking at them again so thank you very much for coming and um, uh, I guess that's it thank you Why did I choose the immune system? Well, we knew that, the, uh, uh, that at least one of the ARPs uh, targeted the VDR, or seemed to target the VDR, possibly targeted the VDR. And because the VDR is key to the immune system, at that point we started looking a bit more widely into its actions. Um, and that's really why we were talking about the immune system. The immune system is, uh, in any case, very closely intertwined with the uh, lipid metabolism, the cholesterol metabolism, in any case. It's very hard to separate them out. Um, but I, I guess what I was surprised was that these drugs that one wouldn't expect to have any effect in the immune system at all uh, did, uh, at least on the computing level, have a very significant effect on key immune system receptors. Have you looked at biologics? No. Are you planning to? The biologics are pretty large molecules. It's a, an extra degree of complexity to, uh, to try and model those. Um, that, yes, I, I have started to think about uh, particularly TNF-alpha. Because right, that would uh, give you, uh, the, you know, the, um, well, it would give you some precision, I think, to begin to develop your thesis here. Yeah. Because um, those are, for the most part, very targeted therapies, as you well know, yeah. in contrast to these drugs, which tend to be dirty. Yeah. And it would help you to figure out um, where the modeling could fit in terms of uh, the cart versus the horse, maybe. Well, I, I think it's important to know that these drugs are dirty.
for, for a start. Um, because I, I think the average uh, clinician out in the field has no concept that the drugs are dirty. Mm. So, so it is actually important to know that the drugs are dirty. Uh, well, well, yes, but I... <laughs> that, that, that's the whole job of the scientists is to get the, 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 the word out. But I, I would encourage you to do that because I, I, to me, I mean, that seems to be the next level of... It is. Of, it, it's uh, an extra... To go on here. You, you're dealing with much bigger molecules. Understood. There, there are some issues uh, with the way that the um, modelling is done. Uh, typically, we work on the receptors as being a fixed receptor, and no protein is fixed. It, it varies. As a, you know, the position varies function of time. Um, as you would know, under not only van der Waal forces but hemodynamic forces and, and, and other things. So, um, and when you when you're dealing with a larger protein, the modelling of the rings and the deformation of the rings becomes very significant, as it does with the steroids. The steroids are, are devilishly difficult to deal with because you've got the four ring confirmation there that, that you have to deal with. But then, you know, looking then and, and going to the next iteration, we'll be looking at. Uh, Various genetic SNPs, whatever, yep. of you know the various pathways in TNF, you know metabolism and such. I mean, because that's where we're trying to figure this out. I'm a rheumatologist. We're trying to figure this out now with the TNF inhibitors and all the biologics that have been released. Um, TNF is it? We we think that they're going to do something, and then you know we just can't seem to find it. For example, so. I, I, I've got this uh, I've got this feeling. It's not a hypothesis. It's just a feeling that that there's something somewhere that activates all these GPCRs in, in uh, extreme infection. Uh, everything goes wrong, the eyes, the everything. Um, don't know what it is. TNF alpha is obviously a good, good place to start looking. Um, uh, also, also uh, interferon gamma, some of those. And yes, we do have that on the, on the books, as it were. But it's an extra level of complexity beyond where we're at now. Uh, we just mastered the steroids, and we thought that was great. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you, uh, uh, is there a uh, simple reference that goes through on a superficial way of the algorithm that was used in your computer estimation of KI? In, in our paper, we uh, well, the actual KI, yes, there is a paper that was published by the group at Scripps that wrote that software that goes into the KI in some detail. I'd like to give you the reference if you have. Uh, I don't have it in my hand, but I can certainly email you okay. with the reference. But, um, in fact, I'm not used to this. Let, let me just show you. I'm to realize that. One, one, one doesn't yeah. think of it that way. Right no, I know, because uh, of history. Uh, what I was going to show you that um, here, this is the vitamin D. This is uh, the steroid prednisolone. Mm -hmm. Let me get it the right way up. Uh, come on, you stupid thing. Let me do it on a computer screen. I can see it better here. Okay, there's the steroid rings. So here are the two steroid rings of prednisolone, and there's the uh, methane on top of it. And here are the other two uh, steroid rings, the other two parts of the steroid ring. And these rings are all bound together. And one of the things about the steroids that makes them effective is this is a very rigid structure. So it only fits in a few places. It doesn't fit in an angiotensin receptor, no matter how hard you try. Now, if you take vitamin D, and this is pure vitamin D, it's not 1,2,5-D, you can see the same two-ring structure right. here, right. and the same structure at the bottom here, uh, including the methane on, on the pole, but the difference is there is no bond across here. These two atoms are not bonded. That's the only difference between them. Now, from the point of view of molecular affinity, that increases the affinity of this molecule immensely because these are all rotatable bonds. So it can twist and turn and, it, and, it. and get itself it's into those, uh, yeah. those receptors very, very easily. I, I really like the example you gave because it did make things clear. Yes. Good. Good. Uh, yes.